This is the second and final lecture on mating systems in animals, and in this lecture we're going to focus on the various forms of polygamy. The first type of polygamy we'll talk about is po polygyny, or polygyny, meaning many females. And this is where there's matings between one male and multiple females. There are various forms of polygyny. Female defense polygyny is where females are defended directly, and this is where females are normally gathered into preformed clusters that then the dominant male can defend. In other cases, the male will defend a territory that is used to attract females, and this is called resource defense polygyny. Then we'll talk about scramble competition polygyny and lek polygyny, and these are considered by many as types of polygyny, but in other cases they're considered promiscuity. Now promiscuity differs from uh, the previous mating systems that we've talked about. In the previous mating systems, they were all defined with regard to the number of individuals involved in pair bonds. So that individuals would have this regular association for the length of, say, a breeding season. In scramble competition polygyny and lek polygyny, individuals will come together um, and mate but then they really won't have anything else to do with themselves after that. And so in, in this situation, that's why some people call it promiscuity. There are no long-term pair bonds. Now the potential for polygyny depends on female distribution and or the importance of the ability for females to choose their mates. So for example, females that are widely dispersed can't be defended. So you're not going to find a female defense polygyny in those cases. In those cases perhaps the males can defend a resource to attract the females together that would make it resource defense polygyny or maybe males just have to go scouting and trying to find as many females as they can that are widely dispersed and that would be an example of scramble competition polygyny or promiscuity. In other cases females may be really choosy which forces males to display together in traditional display grounds and this would make it lek polygyny. Let's first talk about female defense polygyny. This again is where males will defend preformed clusters of females. Examples of this are gorillas, bighorn sheep, where the females are foraging together. The dominant male is able to keep all other males away from this preformed cluster of females. And so in these species, you typically see the evolution of direct male male competition traits like large body size, think of how big male gorillas are, or other weapons like the uh, horns and bighorn sheep. Female defense polygyny exists in some bats where females will gather together to roost and a dominant male can defend this uh, cluster of females and, and have near exclusive mating uh, with these females. Defending males in some species may father between 60 and 90 percent of the young. Another example of this in birds is the Montezuma or Pendula. These are very large tropical orioles where the females build these very large woven nests in colonies and then males can just defend this preformed cluster of females and their nest. And the defending males in this case get about 80% of the copulations. Now the last example is, is a little different. Uh, in the previous examples there was a preformed cluster of females. In siphonectine amphipods, the individuals live in cases made of sand and cell fragments and pebbles. In this case what the males do is they walk around collecting females that they then glue onto their own shell and so they make this cluster of, of females uh, themselves. Now let's move into resource defense polygyny. In this case Females are more widely scattered at first, but the males defend these clumped resources that attract numerous females. So, for example, if males can defend sites that are needed for egg deposition, like in male black-winged damselflies, they defend floating vegetation patches, this is going to attract a large number of females that will mate with these males so that they can lay their eggs in these vegetation patches. Same thing for male antlerflies. Uh, they defend these recently fallen trees, which are sites of egg deposition. And you can see that uh, there's definite direct male-male uh, fighting competition in these antler flies, where they have these modified mouthparts that look like antlers that they use, like deer 
pushing back and forth to establish dominance and ownership of a fallen log. Male cichlids gather uh, and defend multiple snail nests, and these snail nests uh, serve as egg deposition sites to attract females, and the males will then defend uh, and protect these eggs once the female has mated and, and laid these eggs in these territories. Male topi guard green patches of grass to attract females in exchange for matings with the male. Now in the cases of resource defense polygyny, females that are mated to polygynous males may actually lose out in resources or parental care, if parental care is an important uh, variable, to additional females that are in that territory. And so this begs the question, why should females choose an already mated male in situations where they might be able to choose another male and mate in a monogamous situation? Because uh, if, if there's about an even sex ratio in a population um, and one male is defending a territory and has multiple females, then that means there are likely other males uh, out there that don't have a mate. Well, are there trade-offs to choosing either monogamous or polygynous matings? So in the case of a, of a female red-winged blackbird, the beginning of the season, the first females will mate with the, the males of their choice. Females coming onto the scene later will have to decide, do they mate with the individual males that already have females on their territory, or do they mate on territories of males that don't have a female already and just mate monogamously? This question led to the formation of the polygyny threshold model, which attempts to identify the variables that will explain when females should choose to mate monogamously and when they should choose to mate polygynously. There should be a threshold of choosing polygyny over monogamy when certain uh, variables are in line. This uh, model assumes resource defense polygyny and it assumes that there's a great deal of variation in uh, territory quality among the different males that the female could choose among. So, Early in the breeding season, again, the first females are going to mate monogamously, and obviously they're going to choose the highest quality males that have the highest quality territories. And obviously they're going to do this until the high quality territories are full. The next females, however, have a choice. Do they share the male on a polygynous high quality territory? And, that, and sharing involves sharing his parental care potentially and the resources on these really high quality territories. Or do they instead mate with an unmated male so that they can mate monogamously, have all of this male's attention, all of his parental care, but she's going to be stuck with the poorer resources associated with the poorer territory. The polygyny threshold model has been tested with red-winged blackbirds and uh, great reed warblers, and there have been some questions raised about the validity of the poly polygyny threshold model. Some of the assumptions of the polygyny threshold model appear to be violated in most cases. So what are these assumptions? Well, the first assumption is that females are operating under the ideal free distribution, which means that they're free to move among territories and choose what is best for them to maximize their fitness. It also assumes that females know which territories have females already and the resources, the variation in resource quality associated with these different territories. And some of these assumptions, the assumptions I listed above, appear to oftentimes be violated. And this is because of the selfish and opposing concerns that the male has versus what may be best for the female on an already occupied territory. So what's the first violation? There appears to be despotic behavior. Females try to prevent the settlement of additional females on their territory if they've already started mating with a male because this first female looks at these new arrivals as potential competitors for the resources of the territory and or the parental care associated with their mate. So this first female is going to defend the territory against uh, female intruders so that she can maintain a monogamous situation. But males would benefit by having multiple females on their territory. And so males try to hide the fact that a territory is already, already occupied. This obviously is going to inflate the territory's value to the prospective female that's trying to make these decisions. She doesn't have accurate information about the territory's value. 
she thinks this male is unmated, has high quality territory, but having a, a female there, if he can hide that fact, makes it more difficult for her to make an appropriate decision. And in this situation, polygynous females can be forced to make decisions that cause them to have lower fitness. This has been demonstrated with pied flycatchers. You can see here that on polygynous territories, the primary brood, the first brood to get going, typically the male provides parental care to those. And if you look at the mean difference of number of young produced in this situation versus monogamous broods, it's statistically indistinguishable. I mean, it's basically the same as uh, breeding monogamously. Secondary broods, however, definitely are harmed. The male provides much less parental care in this situation, and these females probably would have been better off mating monogamously in another territory. Other females on the territory sometimes get absolutely no parental care, and these no male broods have the lowest reproductive success. So the male in this situation is able to hide the value of the territory, trick females into joining him, and therefore this is violating the polygyny threshold model. All the females obviously are not having equal fitness, which is one of the expectations you would have if this fit the ideal free distribution. Now let's move on to scramble competition polygyny. This is a situation where males are just trying to outrace other males in gaining access to multiple females, and those males that can find and mate with the majority of the females in the population are obviously going to have the highest relative fitness. Again, this fits under a better definition instead of polygyny, since there are no social pair bonds. Some people would prefer to call this a type of promiscuity, uh, because there are no pair bonds. What are some of the traits that lead to males having higher success in this strategy? Well, males that are more persistent in searching and finding females have the highest fitness. So fireflies, the males that are most active, flashing and flying around, getting females to respond so that they can find those females and mate with them, they're going to have the highest relative fitness in the population. The ability to search a wide area and have memories, a good spatial memory of the females as a resource in space and time is going to be a selectively advantageous uh, trait. And this is seen in 13 line ground squirrels in which males remember the location of females that are about to enter estrus. Now why is this so important? Well these females are fertile for a very small window of time, only about a four to five hour window. And so males have to keep track and, and basically keep kind of a, a calendar, appointment calendar in their head of when these females in different locations are going to be fertile. And data uh, from a study indicate that males do spend more time going to areas where estrus females were located but had been removed, uh, indicating that they spent most of their time trying to find females that were in that uh, window of opportunity compared to control females that they may occasionally check up on, uh, but obviously they should spend more of their time trying to find and mate with these uh, fertile females, and that's true whether you look at time searched in the territory of, of estrus females or the number of visits to territories associated with estrus females. And in this study, they actually had removed the females themselves. Therefore, the, the male couldn't pick up any current, say, hormonal uh, scent cues. It was basically testing their ability to find these different females in different states of fertility based upon their past knowledge and testing their spatial and temporal memory. Another form of scramble competition polygyny is seen at explosive breeding assemblages. This is situations where females all breed basically at the same time, highly synchronous breeding, all in one fairly concentrated location. So think of horseshoe crabs in the spring and early summer on the coast where massive groups of these will breed on the, the coast. Uh, wood frogs, as seen here, coming to a pond with these uh, explosive breeding assemblages. And in these situations, really the male, his only option is just to try to find females and breed as fast as you can. There's really no time or ability to control access via dominance. Remember when we talked about optimal foraging, we talked about how it just didn't make sense to establish a territory of a super abundant resource. Well, this is basically the equivalent situation for breeding. 
Uh, this is a, a super concentration of females that are going to be attracting so much attention by rival males that there's no way that you're going to be able to spend the, the time or energy to defend these females and scare, keep these other males away. So you're better off just trying to mate as quickly as you can in scramble competition. The last category of polygyny I want to discuss is lek polygyny. This is situations where males will aggregate in small display territories in which they're trying to convince females to mate with them. And they do so with uh, some very energetic uh, displays that are trying to convince the female of their quality. And so these are uh, typically associated with, again, very energetically expensive displays and uh, elaborate traits that are honest signals of the quality of the male. Females will visit Lex, look among the displaying males, and choose which one to mate with, and then she leaves. So uh, the only th thing that a female gets at a Lex is the genes associated with the male that she mates. There are no resources that are transferred. And because there's no long-term pair bond established, this is also by, considered by many better categorized uh, as a case of promiscuity. Example of this is seen in white bearded mannequins. Males each defend very small territories that include a sapling and bare patches of ground that are surrounding that that they've cleared off. And there can be as many as 70 display areas in 150 square kilometers. So a relatively small area where these males are packing in and the males perform very complex displays which include rapid perch changes, snapping wings and buzzes. Um, it, as a way to try to convince the females that visit the lek to mate with them and not their competing rival males uh, seen at the lek. Females are very choosy and male mating success is highly skewed. This is typical of most forms of polygyny in which a few males get the majority of the copulations, but it can m meet some of its most skewed distributions seen in some of these leks. In a study of mannequins of 438 copulations witnessed at one lek, the first male, a single male, got 75% of these copulations, with the beta male, the second most dominant male, receiving 13 and various other males shared the remaining 12% of copulations. A similar pattern of skewed mating success is seen in sage grouse. Sage grouse also gather at Lex and do these booming vocalization and fancy dances. And in this one study, uh, the first male you can see here received almost 50% of the copulations, the second male receiving about 20, and then it drops off uh, pretty drastically after that third male. Hammerhead bats also will lek. They gather in traditional trees where they form these leks. They call to females from these uh, small display perches that they defend. The females will visit several males before choosing among them, and studies have shown that male success, again, is highly skewed. 6% of the males at a lek are responsible for 80% of the matings. So why do leks form? Various hypotheses and models have been put forth to try to explain how leks form and why leks form where they do. And the first model was called the hot spot model. And the idea here is that males are aggregating in areas where they know they're going to encounter females on the way to a resource. So the resource itself is not a part of the lek, because remember the females don't get any resources at the lek but the males are basically trying to head the females off at the pass, knowing that they're going to be going toward this resource. Another model developed after the hot spot model is called the hot shot model. This is basically stating that subordinate males will gather around a hot shot male that is dominant, that obviously is going to be preferred by most of the females, but the subordinate males are basically acting as satellites, gathering around this hot shot male, hoping to get an occasional copulation, especially if two males end up fighting uh, over females, then some, one of these subordinate males can sneak in and get an occasional copulation. So 
This is uh, an alternative mating tactic, basically, where these satellite males are making the best out of a bad job. A third model is the female preference model or hypothesis, which states that males form groups because this is what's required to stimulate and attract females. Perhaps uh, females will only mate if they're convinced uh, by some group stimulation. So in this case, the LEC can be seen as a group testing ground. And if females don't uh, have enough information, they're simply not going to breed. They have to feel like they've shopped around enough and are getting a good deal. They're picking the highest quality males. And a LEC allows females to make quick comparisons among many males and have that sound feeling about their choices. They're, they're more sure of each male's genetic quality and ensure that they're picking the highest quality male to get the highest quality genes. One key prediction of the female preference hypothesis is that females will prefer larger leks with a greater potential selection of males. This will assure them that they are making wise choices or appropriate choices. One final potential explanation for the formation of leks is that displaying males may be really putting themselves at risk of predation and by gathering in groups they can reduce their individual predation risk through the dilution effect and maybe have better detection of potential predators as we described previously with regard to group foraging. So those same arguments would hold here. And this is data showing for core sizes in frogs the individual predation risk of, of an individual frog is decreasing as the core size increases. So again, this would be an example of the dilution effect. Well, let's look at some tests of the various LEC models that we've already proposed. What if you remove the most attractive male? Well, the hot spot prediction would be that you would see a reshuffling of males to fill the prime vacated position. So in general, the hot spot model claims that LECs will form in areas where females are likely to pass to find a resource, but there might be a hot spot within the hot spot, and you'd expect that reshuffling uh, to occur if you remove the most attractive male. The hot shot prediction varies. You might expect that the subordinate males would gather around the next most attractive individual, but perhaps the remaining males would all look at each other and say, well, we really don't have another hot shot here and so the lek would break up and males would disperse to find another lek that does have a hot shot. In Great Snipe, if you remove the dominant individual, the subordinates do abandon the lek. However, if you remove a subordinate, the subordinates will just simply arrange, rearrange around the dominant. So if, if one of the subordinates was near the dominant hot shot individual, these remaining subordinates will rearrange so that they're positioning themselves in a better position. And again, this agrees with the hot shot model. What about if you see yearly variation in successful lek territories? When black grouse, the most successful lek territory varies from year to year, and it's the dominant male that determines the location, not the location determining who is a dominant male. And subordinate males have increased success as they get closer and closer to this dominant male. Well, it's clear then that this dominant male is a hot shot, so this supports the hot shot model. And this is a figure basically showing a map of an area and showing how the uh, lek position changed from year to year. What if you force leks to move and reform elsewhere? This has been done with fallow deer. They basically defend these patches of grass, and if you cover pieces of grass with black plastic, you force the leks to move. And when they do move, they reform centered around the same individual. Obviously, that is also supporting the hot shot model. What happens when you see lek areas that are actually used by multiple species? This can be seen in some aerial lekking species like insects. Bees will lek some flies, asps, butterflies will form leks. And oftentimes, they will form these leks in the same geographic area. And that may be because the geographic area is just better for funneling pheromones or certain aspects of the wind behavior that, that make these prime uh, ways of dispersing pheromones or they're uh, 
main highways for the movement of females and each of these species is using this area for these physical reasons. Obviously this would support the hot spot model. Well if you look at the location of the lek, does it make sense relative to female movements? This is some data from lecking antelope that shows the dots here are the locations of leks and the squares are indicating different densities of adult females during the breeding season. And what you can see is the leks really aren't anywhere near where the females are and the females have to go out of their way to visit the leks. So this is actually evidence against the hotspot model. It, it contradicts the expectations of the hotspot model. Here's a test of the female preference hypothesis. If the, remember the main prediction of the female preference hypothesis is that females would prefer larger leks um, and larger leks do not appear to be more attractive in U Ugandan cob. Females uh, do not show this preference as would be expected if you look at the mean number of males present it scales linearly with the mean number of females present. And what you would expect is that with increasing male, you would have much faster rate of preference by females. And so these dots would go up on the upper part of this curve faster. If you look at rough, these shorebirds with some very elaborate displays at their legs, you see some support for each of the models. And this isn't really too surprising. I mean, these models are not formulated to be mutually exclusive. So for example, you could have a situation where lex form in a specific region because it's a good way to intercept females, which would support the hot spot model, but the lex may center around in that location the more dominant individual or the hot shot. And if you look across the landscape, the females may prefer the largest lek that is centered around the most dominant hotshot or maybe a couple of hotshots, which would agree with the female preference hypothesis. And finally, you might measure the predation rate of individuals at different size leks and find that there is a lower predation rate and, and lower probability of an individual being killed because of the dilution effect, which would match the expectations associated with the group display uh, as it relates to predation. Well in leks of rough, the leks are generally located near ponds which are visited by females as a resource. So the males do appear to be heading them off as they're on their way to these resources so this fits the hot spot model. But again the lek is near a pond, it's not actually at the resource itself. And in this situation, the females do prefer larger leks, at least to a point. You can see that with low number of males, the copulation rate is relatively low, and then it quickly increases as you increase the number of males up to around five or six, and then it levels off. Lek subordinates closer to the dominant male do have higher fitness. Uh, this is particularly true in the largest leks, and this would support the hot shot model. As you can see here, the, the number of copulation rate for the dominant male is increasing until you get to that five or six uh, point, and then it drops off substantially, and th there are still the same number of females visiting these leks, because this is the, the point where it plateaued in the previous figure, and so there are still the same rate of copulations, but not all of these are going to the dominant male. This drop-off is associated with, in this area, more of the subordinates getting some copulation. Let's now move on to a different uh, type of polygamy, polyandry. And in this situation, this is where a pair bond is established between one female and multiple males. There are two subdivisions of polyandry. One is called cooperative polyandry and is demonstrated by Galapagos hawks where up to eight males will form pair bonds with a single female for years in a territory and help each year raise the single offspring uh, in the single nest. All the males mate with the female, unsure of who has paternity, and they all help to raise the offspring. In Pukekos, seen here, several males will cooperate in territory defense and they all mate with the single female.
classical polyandry is a little bit different. Males in this situation provide all of the parental care at their individual nests. So females will lay a clutch of eggs for each male. The males will then be the sole parent taking care of the offspring at that nest. And in this situation, males are extremely choosy in choosing an appropriate mate. This puts all the sexual selection pressure on females. Females are larger and have more elaborate traits, and we call this sex role reversal. So an example of this is in spotted sandpipers. Females are much larger. Females defend territories to try to convince males to join them in their territory. They will court the males, trying to demonstrate their genetic quality and the quality of their territory. The males that join uh, females will each tend their own clutch of eggs on this female's territory. And what this leads to is the potential for females actually to gain more fitness via quantity than males. So everything is turned around backwards from the typical expectations. Typically you expect the females to go after quality and the males to go after quantity. In this situation, the males are highly selective, making sure they pick the highest quality female because they're limited in the number of young they can produce. But the female wants to collect as many males as possible to lay multiple clutches of eggs, which the males then take care of so the female can gain from the perspective of quantity. What are some of the factors that relate to the evolution of polyandry in spotted sandpipers? Well, they have fixed four egg clutches, and this is true for most of the birds in the order Charadriformes. And if you look at the distribution of polyandry in birds, it's definitely concentrated within this one group. All of them are fixed in four egg clutches, so the only way that a female can increase their fitness is by producing multiple clutches. There's also a male biased sex ratio. This increases the potential of a female to be able to attract multiple mates to care for each of the clutches. And shorebirds produce precocial young. So really it only takes uniparental care. Biparental care isn't necessary, so this kind of relaxes the requirement or linkage between monogamy and biparental care. The male is quite capable of uh, getting food for the young that are produced, and they typically nest in areas where there's abundant insect food. So why do male spotted sandpipers cooperate? Well, males, again, are in this male bias population, and so the chance that a male can mate again, they just don't have that as an option, typically. And if a male abandons their nest, that nest is doomed to failure. And so they don't have many options for getting quantity, and the only option they have for reproductive success is to stay and take care of their nest. Additionally, males that mate early with a female that turns out to end up being polyandrous may have the chance of having fitness associated with the subsequent nests and clutches of eggs that the female lays because the female does appear to store sperm. If the male mates with the female, she uses that sperm to fertilize the eggs for the clutch that he will take care of, she may also store his sperm and use it for the next clutch of eggs in lieu of the sperm that she gets from the next male. So this is one way that some males could still gain in quantity. Similar system is seen in the northern jacanas. Females defend territories to attract males. Males provide all of the parental care uh, to the clutches that the female lays for each male. The females are very aggressive. They destroy nests in neighboring territories of males that have already been recruited by their neighboring uh, female. And they do this to basically recruit the males from these territories. And at first this may seem like a, a puzzle. Why would you join a female who just destroyed your nest? But if you think about it carefully, the male has to make a choice. Do I stay with the female that gave me these clutch of eggs initially? She couldn't protect her territory. So uh, if I nest with her again, the same thing is likely to happen. 
but this big bad mean female that just destroyed my eggs is liable to be able to provide protection so if I go with her and mate on her territory I'm more likely to have reproductive success. The last mating system in polygamy is polygynandry and this is the most rare type of polygamy. The best example I know of is seen in some acorn woodpecker groups. Now different woodpeckers, uh, kind of like what we talked about red-winged blackbirds, some red-winged blackbirds mate monogamously, others mate uh, polygynously. And acorn woodpeckers, they show a variety of mating systems including monogamy and a, a, a few groups show polygynandry. This is where males mate with multiple fem many males mate with multiple females in the group, a stable social group. After mating, all of the females lay their eggs into a single group nest. Subordinate females begin laying first, and the dominant female will begin tossing some of, but not all of these eggs out. She lays eggs last. Subordinate females are afraid to toss any eggs out at that point because they've mixed some of their eggs in there and they don't, can't tell their eggs from the dominant female's eggs. So the dominant female is in control here. She throws out most of the eggs so that most of the eggs are hers, but she leaves just enough of the others so that everyone feels invested in the nest and will provide some degree of parental care. So in review with of polygamy. We first talked about polygyny. This is a situation where mating success of males is highly variable, where a few males have really high fitness and then it rapidly drops off into most of the males in the population having no or very low reproductive success. Polygyny can be represented by female defense polygyny in which preformed clusters of females are guarded by dominant males. It could also be seen in resource defense polygyny in which males defend resources that attract multiple females. We talked about the importance of trying to understand when females will make choices to mate polygynously on high quality territories or monogamously on low quality territories using the concept of the polygyny threshold model. However, we found out that females may not have all of the information they need to make an accurate decision, so some of the assumptions of the ideal free distribution, which is linked to the polygyny threshold model, are violated, and so the females get tricked into choosing polygynous males that they may think are monogamous and having lower fitness because of lower resource availability and lower participation by the males in raising the young. We also talked about scramble competition polygyny, which might better be described as a type of promiscuity since there's no long-term pair bond between individuals. This occurs when females are widely dispersed and there's selection for male traits that allow them to cover more territory and remember the distribution and timing of fertile females. This also is the type of polygyny that you would expect at an explosive breeding assemblage where all the females are breeding at once in a very small area and males are just trying to mate with as many females as they can in a quick period of time. And the last type of polygyny that we talked about is lek polygyny, where you see a concentration of males at small display territories. Females visit these to choose a mate and get genes, but they get no other resources from these areas. And we talked about models that try to explain uh, why leks form and how they form, including the hot spot, hot shot, and female preference model, in addition to the model that, that talked about some of the ways that leks may reduce predation threats. We then moved on to polyandry, and this is a situation where you have sex role reversals, where the females have the sexually selected traits for female-female competition, so females are larger and more aggressive, and they get more elaborate display traits to try to convince males to mate. So instead of female choice, we have male choice. Polyandry can be broken up into cooperative polyandry in which multiple males mate with a female and share the territory defense and parental duties at a single nest, or more classical polyandry in which each male cares for its own clutch of eggs in the female's territory. 
And lastly, we talked about the rare cases of polygynandry in which there is a very large social group where multiple males and females mate together and work together to care for the young.